my dad uh, is going to offer uh, the prayer today, and he's going to do it from his seat over here. So bow your heads in prayer. Our Father, in the quiet of this room, we await your presence. We await your message you have for us. We thank you, Lord, for your mighty power that can wake up the daffodils from a winter rest and make them shine in all their glory. We thank you for the tulips of various shades of the rainbow. And we pray that you will help us today to appreciate the beauty that you provide for us. During our time of sorrow this week, you have brought comfort. During our times of less happy, you've given us a song in spite of it. And now as we wait to hear your voice speak to us quietly in this place of worship, we thank you for your presence with us. In the name of our Lord, amen. Friends, I'm trying to keep the moment. It's different. We're so used to having children's story. Uh, there's so much more that we do in our church service. And, we've, and we're kind of rolling so much more quickly right into the message. All because of COVID. And I'm looking out on this crowd, and I don't see too many that care. So I'm wondering, why can't we go back to worship the way we used to? And with respect to all those who still need to be extremely careful with this crazy disease, and you know who you are. Let's all keep being courteous. But for now, I'm going to try to, to pull us into that worship time. And it's a little different, just running right up here and, and being the next guy up. But that song that we were just singing, think about it. We just had one of our patriarchs pray. We just received a blessing from the throne room of heaven. It's in here right now. Peace. Peace. Wonderful peace. Coming down from the Father above. It's the Sabbath. It's yours today if you want it. You might be like me, one of those that has to say, prone to wander, Lord. I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. But today, on this day, 
we can enter a hiding place with Him that will give us the power to not wander. Do you want this peace today? Oh, I do. I have loved the Sabbath all my life. I know, it's strange. I'm 55. And laying aside the sins of my life that have distorted everything through all the years, the Sabbath has always been a high day. I was fortunate to come up in a home, a Seventh-day Adventist home, with a rebel daddy, and that is an affectionate word to me now. And he taught me differently than, than most that came up beside me. I love the Sabbath. I can't wait till it gets here every week. This love I want to portray to you today. I can remember back uh, through the years and, and thinking of some of the highest days of my life. And from childhood, we would come from South Texas and we'd, we'd come up to San Antonio and go to Laurel Heights Seventh-day Adventist Church, the biggest church in the region, the only ones that could host the Heritage Singers. I had a crush on every one of those girl singers at one point or another. And those were high Sabbaths, I'm telling you. A little more maturity coming in. There's nothing like a Sabbath where all of God's people are joined together by the thousands. Have you ever been to a general conference session? Have you ever sung the songs in, on the Sabbath with all those people? And when you have somebody that knows how to preach, I don't ever want those weekends and those Sabbaths to end. I look back on my life and I think of those wonderful, wonderful Sabbath days. And I see how time has changed, not only the way we view Sabbath, but how we approach Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And we have been burning nitrous oxide, high octane, all week long, and we don't have any energy left when we get here to the Sabbath day. The best day of the week, and we're burnt out. Why? Why is it like that? The Sabbath, our hiding place. I want to hide in Jesus today. So as we get going this morning, I'm going to ask you to do one point of participation with me. And we'll start rolling the slides and have a little fun, have a little... Uh, seriousness, and hopefully a lot of teaching, because what's coming up, um, uh, I'm looking forward to what my wife has to say. I think you're going to find it very powerful. Uh, I should have also said that Brian uh, laid out the table so wonderfully in Sabbath school this morning. I wish all of you could have been here for that. It was absolutely incredible setting up this day and, and what we're talking about. But I'm also particularly looking forward to it's Tim and then it's Kim. And then we are bringing up, you know, one of our uh, royal young couples, James and Lindsay, are going to come up and, and wrap up our worship hour together. It's going to be wonderful. So right now as we kick off and get going, I want you to do something with me. And then we'll have a word of prayer. And I'm going to start rolling my slides. Would you... Speak aloud with me, Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter 
nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it. Yes. Heavenly Father, sanctify this hour. We are here to worship you. Lord, we want to deeply connect with you. Lord of the Sabbath, be the Lord of our hearts this morning is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. National Geographic, it's my favorite channel. Kim has to put up with me watching all kinds of stuff on this channel. But oh my goodness, a few years ago they did something that was absolutely incredible. I, I'm, I'm certain that most of you have bumped into what I'm about to uh, portray to you right now. But uh, maybe you'll see it in a different light today. National Geographic along with Dan Buettner. Dan wanted to figure out where and why people lived so long. And, and he wanted to learn the secrets of living long. So he went to studying and he has come up with this idea that he calls blue zones. And we're going to go through slide by slide nine points this morning of how you can have a long life. You're going to be shocked at how this ties to what we're talking about today. But Dan says that the life expectancy of an American born today averages 78.2 years. You know, that's longer than it used to be. I remember when they used to tell us it was, it was 70, and I remember them telling us once upon a time that even back pre-1950, except uh, for the uh, agrarian type peoples, it was even shorter. But, but this year, the year that he was doing all this blue zone study, over 70,000 Americans reached their 100th birthday. You'd be surprised to know what people group those, those come from. Now, what are they doing that the average American isn't? Uh-oh, I think a blue pie, the next slide. What did I do wrong? Oh, uh, no, was that it? Yeah, this is it. I'm good. <clears throat> so Dan says, we found five places that met our criteria of this long life. Now, there's the Barbagia region of Sardinia. They're, they're a mountain highlands. They're, they're, they don't really have that big of an access to the outside world. They're kind of cut off in the mountains. There's Icaria, Greece. Now, this picture that's in the background, that is Icaria, Greece. That's an island. It's kind of off in the Aegean Sea and doesn't really have too much great access to the rest of the world either. I just find this kind of interesting what's in common about these places. Nicoya Peninsula, Costa Rica. Uh, this place has got the world's lowest rates of middle age mortality and the second highest concentration of male centenarians. But again, it's a peninsula. A peninsula is like Florida. So it's still, it's not really like terribly accessible to everything else. It's off on its own. And then finally, Okinawa, Japan. <clears throat> this is females over 70 are the longest lived population in the world. But Okinawa, again, an island. Hmm. So he found four places where we get some really long lived people. And then he found this the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So you don't have to go to an island. You don't have to go to a peninsula. All you got to do is join the Seventh-day Adventist Church. <clears throat> because they live 10 years longer than their North American counterparts. Huh. Why is that? 
Now, he did find out because he was looking for places, and I'm messing around a little bit, but he said the highest concentration is in Loma Linda, California. Now, isn't that neat? It's not so much a place. Worldwide, you, if you'll live like a Seventh-day Adventist, you can, anywhere in the world, have longevity. How? Why? What if I told you that you didn't have to, that you could cancel your gym men, em, membership? What if you could cancel your gym membership and be healthy? Blue zone rule number one, all these people from all these five blue zones move more naturally. The world's longest lived people, they don't pump iron, they don't run marathons, they don't join gyms. Instead, they live in environments that constantly nudge them into moving without thinking about it. They grow gardens. They don't have mechanical conveniences for house and yard work. So that's what's one thing that's in common with these people groups that know how to live a long time purpose. The Okinawans call it ikigai, and the Nicoyans call it plan de, plan de vida. For both, it translates to why I wake up in the morning. Purpose. Did you know you Seventh-day Adventists have a purpose? Do you know what it is? Knowing your sense of purpose is worth up to seven years of extra life expectancy. We have an incredible purpose given to this special people group. And we would all do well to learn what that is and get involved in it. Blue zone, power, nine lifestyle habits. Number three, downshift. All right. So even people in the blue zones experience stress. stress. Stress leads to chronic inflammation. By the way, the words that I've got up here, they're not mine. They're Dan Buechner's. I am simply throwing the quotes from his work up here. Okay? I wanted you to know I'm reading his stuff. Stress leads to chronic inflammation associated with every major age-related disease. What the world's longest-lived people have that we don't are routines that shed that stress. Okinawans take a few moments each day to remember their ancestors. Adventists pray, read the Bible, and Sabbath. Isn't that neat how he found that out? Icarians take a nap. And don't be mad at me, Sardinians do happy hour. <laughs> I'm quoting him. I'm not recommending. <clears throat> All right. This is another one that Tim Tidwell needs to learn. I love this rule. 80% rule. You ever heard that saying, Hara Hachibu? I never did either. Uh, uh, Confucian mantra that the Okinawans say that reminds them to stop eating when their stomachs are 80% full. The 20% gap between not being hungry and feeling full could be the difference between losing weight or gaining it. And people in the blue zones eat their smallest meal in the late afternoon or early evening, and they don't eat anymore the rest of the day. Hmm. Yes, I need to learn the 80% rule myself. And, but I find it interesting that we have kind of switched a little bit to diet here. And my subculture knows so much about diet. The plant slant. Blue zone, power nine, number five, beans. Hmm, we sure do a lot of soy, including fava, black soy, and lentils. They're the cornerstone of most centenarian diets. Meat is eaten, on average, only five times a month, and then when it is, when it is, it's a little deck of card serving size. We're talking a small amount of meat. Got to go vegetarian. Better yet, vegan. But if you're not there, hey, keep to the clean stuff and start working it out of your diet. Okay, don't be mad at me. But this is what he found. People in all the blue zones except Adventists. 
That is his words, not mine. People in all the blue zones except Adventists drink alcohol moderately and regularly. The trick is to drink one to two glasses per day with friends and or with food. And no, you can't save up all week and have 14 <laughs> drinks on Saturday. <clears throat> okay, I, you know, I've probably done that with a few other things I've tried to lay down before. <laughs> But I put the pretty little girl up there drinking water, okay? I wasn't going to confuse you that I actually espouse this part of blue zone living. <clears throat> but you know what you could do is go get the red grape juice at, at Walmart and get the resveratrol that God intends you to get, okay? Okay? But just to stay away from the inflammatory alcohol. Number seven, power habit. Number seven is belong. All but five, count them, five of 263 centenarians belonged to some faith-based community. And research shows that attending faith-based services four times per month will add four to 14 years of life expectancy. How about that? So you're here today so that you can live a long time. That's right. Number eight, loved ones first. All right? Successful centenarians in the blue zones put their families first. This means keeping aging parents and grandparents nearby or in the home. They commit to a life partner. Hmm which can add up to three years of life expectancy. How about that? You, yeah. Do you like that? Get married, you live longer. <laughs> and invest in their children with time and love. They'll be more likely to care for you when the time comes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and number nine. Here's his last... Last PowerPoint, number nine, the right tribe. Hmm. The world's longest lived people choose or were born into. I like how he says that, choose. You might not have been born Seventh-day Adventist. You certainly probably in this group today weren't born o Okinawan or, or Sardinian. But, but you can choose to join up with God. And the social circles that are supported by healthy behaviors. Are we doing that in our church, friends? Okinawans created, I have no idea how to say that, something was, groups of five friends that committed to each other for life. And research from the Framingham studies show that smoking, obesity, Happiness and even loneliness are contagious. Ooh, I never thought of obesity as contagious. So the social networks of long-lived people have favorably shaped their behaviors. It's belonging. It's being together. And that's what church potluck is supposed to do. So in the post-COVID world, we need our family time together again, friends. We've got to connect with each other. It's that social network that does so much for our overall, overall well-being. Now, I can't go any further than point number one on this one. But Dan Buettner had a lot to say about Loma Linda and Seventh-day Adventists. And he said that the biggest blue zone secret for our people group is to find a sanctuary in time. I mean, I, if I could change his words up there, I'd say find a, the sanctuary in time. The Sabbath is our sanctuary. Dan says a weekly break from the rigors of daily life. The 24-hour Sabbath provides a time to focus on family, God, camaraderie, and nature. And Adventists claim this relieves their stress 
strengthens social networks, and provides consistent exercise. The Sabbath, our sanctuary in time, it has more to do with our well-being than any of the other nine points. What's the big deal about the Sabbath? Think about it from what Butner had just said. We get a little exercise on Sabbath. That's our day to get out and get into nature. We're getting that moderate exercise. We're getting the families outside. Sabbath, we've got that, we've got that social connection. We've got the downshift. We've got the ability to belong. We've got our loved ones first. We've got the social circle of support. Six of the nine, six of the nine blue zone secrets all come under the Sabbath. What a powerful day. What's the big deal about the Sabbath? I came up here with my computer. I'm discombobulated. I am going to try to find what I wanted to say next on my phone really quick. Forgive me. On this day, the Sabbath, more than on any other, it is possible for us to live the life of Eden. It was God's plan for the members of the family to be associated in work and study, in worship, and in recreation. The father as the priest of his household, and both father and mother as teachers and companions of their children. But the results of sin, having changed the conditions of life, to a great degree prevent this association. Often the father hardly sees the faces of his children throughout the week. He's almost wholly deprived of opportunity for companionship or instruction. Oh, but miracle of miracles and wonder of wonders. God's love has set a limit on the demands of toil. And over the Sabbath, he places his merciful hand in his own day. He preserves for the family opportunity for communion with him, with nature, and with one another. Happy Sabbath. What's the big deal about the Sabbath? God wants to visit with us every day of the week. But the Sabbath is a special time for intimacy. Now this is an awesome thought, that that Creator who holds up vast galaxies throughout the universe longs with an intimate relationship with us. You know, often we focus on what God wants us to do on Sabbath. But what, about God, but what about what God wants? How disappointed He must feel if we won't make the connection. How disappointed He must feel when we turn the day into mere rules and regulations of what we should or shouldn't do how disappointed he must feel when all we talk about on Sabbath is our jobs and our hobbies and next week, and he's longing to spend time with us. You see, in Eden, we were given marriage and the Sabbath. You know, on the first day, God created light. We tend to think of Adam and Eve created somewhere along Friday morning and, and uh, then they only have a few hours left to get to Sabbath. Thursday nights when God started creating all the animal kingdom, 
we don't think, we, 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 we've gotten accustomed to our worldly way of looking at the days of the week. Fr sorry, y'all know what I meant. I think you were hearing me. Friday night, that creation starting under very wonderful conditions. God's already set up this amazing planet beautifully. Light abounding. The moon and the stars ruling the night. But it's light and glorious all over. It's not dark like we experience today. And after that animal kingdom is set up, he purposely forms every, every part of his new son, Adam, and breathes into him the breath of life and then shows him that animal kingdom that he had just set up. Jesus, the Creator, is wanting this communion with Adam, and he takes him and says, Hey, why don't you figure out the names of all these animals? And then Adam discovers, Well, wait a minute. How come they always have an extra one and I don't? And here comes Eve. Now, Eve did, might, might have already been created, created by, say, three in the morning. I don't know. I'm just trying to mess with your pure minds. It... It's, it's not anything like we think. It's far, far, far better and glorious. But God gave us marriage and Sabbath. He gave us Eden. He gave us His Word. And what is the enemy's plan? The enemy has been working very hard to take away our Eden lifestyle. How we eat, our health. I've got McDonald's and Burger King on every corner throughout this nation. We have lost our connection to Eden. The Word of God. Satan's been doing everything he can to pervert the Word and to cause us to not trust it. He's been perverting the Word of God. Another institution that came from Eden. And then marriage. Marriage. The most sacred of God's institutions. And marriage has been under amazing attack in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, marriage has just been pulled down. Not just by divorce, but by every optional lifestyle that this world is trying to say you can find happiness in. We were given marriage in Eden, and Satan has been working to tear it down. And the last great attack of the enemy before the great controversy is finished is coming over the Sabbath. And Satan is doing all he can to get us to forget the Sabbath day. To forget our origins. Think about it. <clears throat> I'm going to save that thought. I'm going to go to the next slide. You might not have ever thought about this. But the Sabbath is the science of overcoming sin. Have you ever considered it this way? You see, by faith, we accept the righteousness of Christ to cover our sins. So we come to Jesus and we say, Lord, I see your way is better. I repent. Will you forgive me? Cover my sins. By faith, I accept the righteousness of Christ to overcome my sins. Most people stop at, oh good, Jesus has got it covered. And thank the Lord he does because every week I fall and fail. But Jesus wants me connecting with him all the time to help me overcome my sins. And it's by faith that I pull in His power to do this. By faith, I'm accepting 
his victory in his life as the second Adam to come and cover my sins. But by faith, I allow his life to come and live inside me to give me the ability to overcome. But then one more, by faith, I accept the righteousness of Christ to be transformed into his image. This is the recreation. We experience redemption when we come to him at our point of repentance. But recreation is the, is the job of the Sabbath. It's where we find our highest point of being able to be transformed in Jesus. Faith. What is faith? That is, uh, I found this little sketch. That's John G. Patton. He was a missionary to the South Seas. And he had the hardest time explaining faith to these people. These were cannibalistic peoples. And talk about having a hard time coming in from the English language, being able to teach these people. And, uh, and he was struggling to get them to understand what faith meant. So one of these South Seas people comes up to him, had been working out in the field, was very tired, and come up to uh, Missionary John's front porch, and there's a big wicker chair on the front porch. And, in that, and, and the missionary asked him, please, have a seat in the wicker chair. And so the man sat down there, and he said a word in their language that meant... I am resting all my weight here. And the missionary knew that that was the word that he could translate faith with. So he picks up this word and begins to explain to all these South Seas peoples how to understand faith. I am resting all my weight here. I'm resting on Jesus' power to cover me. I'm resting on Jesus' power to give me victory and on Jesus' power to transform me. And when we come to the Sabbath, this is our highest opportunity to rest all of our weight on Him. See, the Jews lost this understanding and they, they, they were not following the righteousness of Christ. And it led them to make the Sabbath burdensome and full of all kinds of requirements. But the Sabbath is here for transformation. See, God wants a day-by-day -day relationship. We've got to be plugged into the vine day-by-day. -day. But the Sabbath is a special plug-in. The Sabbath is the highest point of nutrients. All day the Lord is watering us in His garden. But on the Sabbath, He pours in the food and the fertilizer. We need to be connected on the Sabbath day. It's all about relationship. It's not about what I do and what I don't do. It's about being connected to Jesus. Why? Because we are sanctified by Jesus' presence sanctification, the sanctity of the Sabbath can become ours by resting in Him. So I'm at wrap-up. This is my last section. And Kim, you come up next. But I want to ask you, so what about the three angels? Don't we Seventh-day Adventists have a certain calling, a certain purpose, a certain understanding that the world needs to hear? And I believe the answer is an absolute, resounding, and very loud yes. Our job is to proclaim the Sabbath more fully. Not because it's the right day and we can prove it biblically. Are you hearing me there? We need to proclaim the Sabbath because of its transforming power in our lives. When our denomination was rising, 
Satan raised up a whole bunch of counterfeits himself. Atheism, secularism, Darwinian evolution. Satan was going to do everything he could to keep the world from being able to understand this amazing Sabbath truth. Sometimes we'll get into our teaching of it. And we get into describing the players of Revelation 13 and so forth. And we come across as a people that are right. And I've got to tell you, friends, that sometimes the way we present is offensive to our brothers and sisters of other sheepfolds. We come across as so right. You know, I remember back in my younger days, my wife would tell me I was a know-it-all. And, and after I did one of my typical know-it-all comments, she would remind me that I was, okay, that I was a jerk. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, <laughs> I learned those lessons back in those days. <laughs> but those lessons have set well with me as it relates to our projection of the Seventh-day Adventist message. We don't want to come across as a jerk to all of our friends from other faiths. We have something incredibly special here, something that's worth conveying to the whole world. And we've got to tell them the right way. Well, we're all working on this together. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you I know the answers. I am struggling today to find those ways to connect with everybody in this world. I want to say it right. I want to say what is right of God. I want my Sabbath keeping in my life to portray the image of Jesus, not the image of the beast. And when the world starts seeing the image of Jesus in us and in our Sabbath keeping, I can tell you that our message will finally have the power that's going to spread throughout the whole world and bring in a people that have been waiting to hear this message. The Holy Spirit's going to help all this be accomplished. The point this morning is that we need to let it be accomplished in our lives. What will they see of our Sabbath keeping? The rest of our worship time together, we're going to shift gears and talk about making the Sabbath a delight. I'm very excited to invite my wife up here, Mrs. Kimberly Renee Tidwell. Would you come and take this stage? <laughs> They're switching to Kim's PowerPoint slideshow now, and she has some really special things that I'm looking forward to hearing. Kim, take over. You gotta have that though. Oh, this. Happy Sabbath. It is Sabbath is a delight. Uh, I always loved the Sabbath when I was growing up. Um, we had our traditions. It looks diff. It looked different whenever I was raising kids. Um, my dad would make us put away all the newspapers, <laughs> so we wouldn't be able to read them. Uh, we would have our shoes shined Friday before sundown. Amen. Things were different. Um, then, I, then we had our kids and I was able to work uh, for the Texas Conference and also the Southwestern Union. So I was off on Fridays. So we were able to get everything prepared 
for the Sabbath. Unlike today, right? And that's what I want to tell you. Unlike today. Unlike today. Um, I want to tell you, tell you that um, I, I work, I'm a teacher, but I'm a teacher in Springdale in a poverty school. And it takes a lot of time. We have to do house calls for kids that don't have food. That has taken up um, a lot of my emotional energy to be able to enjoy the Sabbath. And I was looking at a Facebook, it was probably about two years ago, and Maddie Hostetter Little, um, she posted this, an excerpt from this book. It's okay. And it's The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And of course, I needed that desperately. I wanted it. Um, I was not able to enjoy the Sabbath the way, a delight the way God wanted, because I would be very stressed. Um, I worked and then I went back to school about five years ago to U of A to get my therapist license. And when Sabbath came, I had a migraine because I was going 90 miles an hour and then all of a sudden you stop. And whenever you don't live the other six days the way God intended, stopping is not easy. My body could stop but my brain couldn't stop. And I'd wake up thinking about my kids, my students. I'd wake up worrying about them. I'd wake up thinking of, I got to do a term paper as soon as sundown. I was, my mind was just always busy. Um, and then I started reading this book. Well, I did not pick up this book until quarantine. And if you don't realize that's been a year ago. And a year ago yesterday, I was packing up my room, um, not knowing what was going to happen. <clears throat> and then we did not go back to school until um, August. So I had some time. And I read this book. And I've read it three times because I need constant reminders about what it means to really Sabbath, to really Sabbath. Um, like I said, four years ago when I was in school and working, there was times when I would tell Tim, oh, please just go to church. Just let me be by myself because I had such a headache. Um, I was not experiencing the Sabbath that God in delighting in it. So let's look. When I studied this, I started studying it during quarantine. I looked at what the Sabbath was meant to be. Um, we know that the word Sabbath comes from the Hebrew Shabbat. Well, what does that word literally mean? It means to stop. But it doesn't only mean stop, it means to delight. Oh, I was stopping physically, but I wasn't delighting. I was glad for a day off, yes. But that's not what the Sabbath is about. The Sabbath is simply a day to stop stop working, stop wanting, stop worrying, just stop. Oh, we may stop, but do we delight? I love this verse in the Bible. I read it. I want you to marinate on it. It says, come to me, all you who are weary and burden, and I will give you rest. Oh, that sounded so good to me. How many in this chaotic world are we worried and burdened? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Mm -hmm. I wanted that, we all want that. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So I started thinking, yoke? All I know about a yoke is this. 
A yoke? Why would Jesus say that? A yoke is designed, it's fitted around the neck of an oxen for a purpose of binding them together. How did that pertain to me? How does that pertain to us? Essentially, a yoke was a harness used by oxen and other animals. And this is a key word. Like when I'm teaching, I say, what's the main idea? What you're reading? To ease the work of hauling a load. That's what the yoke is. Oh, Lord, I needed that. It was also meant as a designation of servitude and carrying the burden of a task or a mission. That's what the yoke is. I needed that servitude. I had it all during the week. I was serving. I thought I was, I was doing good, but I was worn out from it. Answer this question for me. When you see someone, what do people normally answer when you ask this question? Hi, how are you doing? Oh, I'm good, just busy, just tired. I'm good, just tired. It's like it's a medal of honor or something. I'm busy. I'm tired. Slow. Do you imagine Jesus being fast? Do you imagine when you're praying to him, talking to him, he's looking at his phone going, why he's texting going, okay, no. But that's where we're at right now. What has the highest value in Christ's kingdom's economy? What is it? It's love. It's love. Love your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. But look at this. And this is what this book and the Bible and spending time has helped me. Hurry and love are incompatible. Hurry and love are like oil and water. They simply don't mix. Hmm. And the biggest one is hurry is a death of prayer. Hmm. It's a death of prayer. I'm like, when I listen to <clears throat> Shirley Williams talk, I think during quarantine, quarantine really brought out a lot of things in, a, in people because we were able to literally stop and pray, and read, to find your purpose. And I realize that, Lord, I'm so hurried that my prayers are on the way to work in the car. So here's the problem. Fast forward to right now. Our Sabbaths look different than when I was little, when our kids, and now. Do we even know the meaning of the word boredom? Do our kids know that? No, I teach kids, and all they're thinking about is video games, and I have to get them back focused. Boredom, we can't even stand in a line in a grocery store without looking at our phones. <laughs> I'm the worst. I was. I'm learning. When I'm at a red light, I'm answering an email to my colleagues. One of the surprising things that I learned when I began to practice the Sabbath is that to really enjoy the seventh day, you have to slow down the other six days. And I'll say that again. You have to slow down the other six days. God help us. And yes, Lord help us. How do we... And then the biggest problem is digital distraction. Jesus had a reference for quiet alone time in everyday life. And it was part of practicing his faith. It should be non-negotiable for us, too, if we want to live an emotionally healthy life. And then here's a quote and from this book. An over-busy Digitally distracted life of speed is the greatest threat to your spiritual life that we face in this modern world. 
the greatest threat, when you think it was so many other things <clears throat> that's going on, but now we're distracted. The speed, everything's fast. And that's our greatest threat to our spiritual life that we face in this world right now. I love what Corey Ten Boone says. If the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Both sin and busyness have the same effect. They cut you off from your connection to God and other people. And I think there's a, a key there, other people. When I stayed home, I wasn't with other people. Um, I go to a naturalist doctor in Fayetteville and we were talking about the blue zones and that I was Seventh-day Adventist in the Sabbath and he loved it. And he said, out of everything that the Adventists have right, he said, it's their community. He goes, you can eat bad, you could do all the other things, but if you have that community, that's what we need, that connection. Do you see how the Sabbath is? It's a relationship. It's relationship based. And it's also to reach out to other people. So what's the solution? I gave you a problem. We know it's a problem. But there has to be a solution. And I'll tell you, the solution isn't more time because we'd fill that time. <clears throat> but Jesus offers a yoke. A yoke. It's a new way to carry life, fresh way to bear our responsibilities. We can't run from our problems. We can't run from responsibilities. We can simplify our lives. But his yoke will develop in us a balance. There's the key. That yoke is balanced. We need that balance. I need that balance in my work. And um, we're going to carry that will give us the, the rest on the other six days. How I have done that, how I've committed to do that <clears throat> since quarantine, is to get up an hour earlier every morning um, and ask the Lord. That means I have to go to bed earlier. You have to turn off, turn off that distraction, our TVs, our phones. I go to bed earlier and then I get up an hour earlier to have quiet time, to spend time with him. Because I can't do this without him, and I don't want to. Um, I've learned boundaries. I'm not answering emails after a certain time. Whatever it is for you, a solution. <clears throat> but remember that God gave us what we needed. And the best thing is a gift of the Sabbath. Thank you for the Sabbath. Society tells us the more we produce, the more we consume, the happier our life will be. You feel it, don't you? Don't you? I wanted more, so I went back to school. I wanted, what if there was a better way of living? We have the answers. God has given us the answers. What if, what if the answer to your soul's weariness was to simply stop long enough to be still and know that he is God. Amen. And then I won't go into this because I didn't realize, Tim, it was about the blue zone and how amazing gift that we do have. To me, this is our witness to the world. This is it. But we got to live different the other six days. This is what I've learned. What I've learned, the Sabbath is governor, governor on the speed of life. So what I do today is going to tell me my Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. <clears throat> and to really enjoy the seventh day, you have to slow down the other six days. You can't go 90 miles per hour all week, running the pedal to the floor for six days straight, and then all of a sudden you think you're, you're just going to stop. It doesn't happen, I know. Sabbath isn't just a 24-hour time slot in your weekly schedule. It's a pace and rest 
that goes with us throughout your week. A way of bearing fruit and abiding in him. Abide in him. Put that phone away. Turn off the TV and abide in him. Set your alarm clock earlier to have the strength to enjoy the Sabbath and make it a delight. <clears throat> of course, I'm still learning. To me, Sabbath is a way to say, enough, enough. Enjoy what I already have. I don't need more. Be present in the ordinary life that you have. I think that's the hardest thing for me, is to be present. I've, I'm learning to slow down, and I'm learning to enjoy the life with God every day. And that makes my Sabbath sweeter. So, I'm sorry, you told me only five minutes. <laughs> Man. I told her five minutes because I know how it is when you get up here. It turns into 10 real easy. <laughs> but um, Mimi, high five. Now I've got, I've got another special couple that I want to bring up here now. Uh, I wanted somebody from our younger ranks, somebody that's in the act of actively raising children. And I love James and Lindsay Wilson. I've known James since he was a little boy. And... Uh, it's a real privilege to be able to get them up here. They're going to share just a few more things before we wrap up today. Come on up. So, Tim asked us to share um, a few ways that we try to make Sabbath a delight. For our children or things that we do as a family and we were kind of thinking and talking about this and we said well let's go straight to the source let's see what they have to say you know what's important to them um, and each one of them has a little something to share and then we'll talk more at the end here what I like it one thing and that I like about Sabbath is that grandparents can come over and we can eat together and we have a special worship and we light our Sabbath candle Amen. Amen. In our family, one thing that I like about the Sabbath is that if the weather's nice, we get to go outside, go to a creek, or in the woods, maybe with friends, or go camping, or do something outdoors that we normally wouldn't get to do. Amen. One thing that makes the Sabbath special to me is when I go to bed on Friday night, I know in the morning when I wake up, Dad will be home. I'll get to come here to be with church. We're not rushing around everywhere, doing chores, doing work, going shopping. <laughs> and we, and then we get to spend time and come here to visit our church family. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, guys. So, yeah, you guys can sit down. Uh, so, when I was thinking about, I'm up here. When I was thinking about the things that that they mentioned okay they're talking about um time with god coming to our church uh family time time with our friends time out in nature that's it right that's all that's all the important stuff so it's easy as for kids and for us adults too to think about okay well i can't do this and i can't do that and oh i have to stop doing that even though i don't i'm not quite ready to stop right now um but you know, sports, uh, shopping, the disdain of Micah's life, um, <laughs> TV, all, all of that stuff, that's yours too, yeah. That, that's, the, that's the junk, that's the in-between, that's the stuff that, that we don't really need. So it's pretty awesome to just take note of the fact that Sabbath is all the good stuff. God doesn't want to take anything away from us or any fun stuff away from our kids. He just wants us to allow him to bless us. And one, one more quick thing, you know, Micah mentioned getting to come to church. Um, probably the number one reason that my kids do look forward to the Sabbath um, is you guys. Um, we have a church family, and I know it's not, it's not like that everywhere. Um, it's not like that for everyone, just because they're a Christian and they come to church. Um, 
But we come here and they are with all of their extended family. I mean, for you guys to know the names of the kids in our church, to talk to them, to show an interest in their lives, um, to, for them to know that there are adults who love them and care about them outside of their family. Um, yeah, we always think back to our first time really visiting Springtown as adults, as parents, and you know, there was Lyman Williams greeting, <laughs> greeting our whole family and asking who we were and where we were from and like learning our kids' names and, and calling them by name every single time they walked through the doors after that. And um, he set a great example for all of us, and there are so many people like that in this church. And I just encourage you all to know that it means something um, to all the families with young kids. It makes a huge impact in their lives. Um, for my kids, they've all really grown up in this church, and you guys will forever be, you know, their extended family. So Amen. being able to come here and be with you guys is, is one of their biggest blessings. So. Potluck. <laughs> we miss potluck. <laughs> that uh, high above boo 80% rule doesn't apply to me on second <laughs> Sabbath. <laughs> As we can tell. <laughs> But it's kind of hard to follow this act, um, okay. and everything that Tim's Tim and Kim have said, Tim, yeah. it all hits home. Yeah. Every single one of us can take that and apply that to our home, <laughs> and our family, in our lives, with our children. We try to make it special every day, you know, but today's the special day. Amen. You know, I, can, I go to work. I got to put food on the table. I got to spend time doing other things besides focusing on my family. And at the end of the day, what's the most important thing? Yeah. It's our family. Yeah. Right? Um, and for James, he, you know, he has a full-time job, but then he comes home and we're, we're renovating our house. And you know, we're trying to homeschool. We've got so much going on all the time. So I know for him, it's like, yeah. When are you going to start this next project? When's that due going to be done? When are we going to do this? Very large honey to-do list. Oh, yeah. But I can slow down. Yeah. I can stop. And today, I don't have to worry about those things. I don't have to think about Amen. the kitchen Amen. or the whatever, whatever it may be. I can come and I can spend time with Amen. my second family. You know, this is a second family. And we do need to spend more time outside of that. We, you know, we've talked about this at men's men's weekend or men's group and stuff is you know outside of this one couple hours on the weekend call each other up you know reach out to people because some people do have a hard time outside of sometimes this is the only community that they get outside of their work week so kind of instill that into your family and into your lives and into your children that this is a day to be not to fret about or oh i turn the tv off make it special Come you know together. Come together, bring them out, do stuff with them. It doesn't have to be, you know, something they have to worry about. It should be a blessing for them as well. Amen. We want to thank you guys for being a special part of our Sabbaths and our family. And I want to thank you, too, for coming up here because that was an absolute delight, wasn't it? I got our young people leading out the way it should be. I want to keep the Sabbath better. Has this been good this morning? Amen. Family. You're connected to your Heavenly Father right now. Let His blessing of the Sabbath come in deeply into your hearts. Suck it in. Share it to your children. Watch them share it back to you. I'm so thankful that we've had this moment feeling the Sabbath differently than we have been, especially in this last year of COVID. I pray all of us will recommit ourselves to the connection with Jesus that comes on this wonderful, special day. And that the blessing of this day will carry you all through the coming week. Heavenly Father, thank You for giving us the Sabbath.
come into each one of our hearts. Cover us with this sanctuary of time. Let us all find our hiding place in You today is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Have a great afternoon together.